Green IFA webinar on No Quarantine for Democracy. I'm Simon and I'll be moderating this chat this lunchtime. Um, you can ask questions on Facebook uh, or in the Q&A in Zoom and we'll answer them later in the webinar. So to give some context, uh, the webinar now is the second in a series from the Green IFA group in the European Parliament responding to the COVID-19 crisis and looking in detail at the Green Recovery and Resilience Plan developed by our group, which you can find on our website. And I hope maybe Rita will share in the chat here in Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, we're asking a simple question uh, with these webinars and in these unprecedented times, and that's what Europe do you want to return to? Um, and I'm very glad that we uh, today are focusing on democracy um, and happy to introduce our four panelists to cover the issue in detail. So we have Heidi Hautala, the Vice President of the European Parliament with responsibilities for human rights and democracy, among other things. We have Gwendolyn delbos Corfield. I hope I pronounced that right, a uh, member of the Constitutional Affairs Committee and European Parliament Rapporteur for Rule of Law in Hungary. We also have Terry Renke, member of the Committee of Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs and co-chair of the LGBTI Intergroup and Daniel Freund, um, he's a member of the Budget Control Committee and the uh, Green Coordinator for the Constitutional Affairs Committee and member of the Working Group on the Conference on the Future of Europe. Thank you all for joining us. Hope you're all well in your various different lockdown modes around Europe. Um, we'll take some questions after the opening remarks, which we'll try to keep concise in order to answer as many questions as possible as they come in. So, as we know, tomorrow is Europe Day, and it's 70 years since the Schuman Declaration, which sparked the beginning of the EU formation and integration as we now know it. So it's a perfect moment to focus on the state of EU democracy, um, and we'll do so in a few areas. Uh, what's next for EU democracy? How has this crisis tested it? And how can we ensure a vibrant democracy thrives um, at EU level in our institutions and also in member states? Um, we'll also look at how this crisis has exacerbate, exacerbated existing rule of law issues in some member states, particularly with Hungary and Poland. Um, and thirdly, uh, how you as Green members of the European Parliament hope to address these concerns going forward, um, whether we get back to normal and perhaps some of these changes are, are permanent um, as well. So we need to think about this. So let's first turn to Heidi. Um, Many people might be aware of what's happening in their own countries when it comes to democratic issues and the current crisis, but they might be less uh, aware of the challenges at EU level, the functioning of the European Parliament, um, especially considering it's a critical time when we're trying to coordinate a collective response to the biggest crisis the EU has ever faced. Um, from your role as vice presidents, how are things looking? Yeah, thanks for that question. Of course, we are the only uh, transnational parliament in the world. And uh, this is a particular challenge for us uh, in these weeks uh, because uh, national borders are closed. And uh, some of us can travel to Brussels to be uh, fully fledged MEPs with certain very strict hygiene uh, requirements, but uh, many of us uh, cannot travel to Brussels. So it's a bit of a feeling of being a two tier parliament at the moment. And um, our group has been very, very concerned about uh, this sort of uh, uh, class division. And we want to, to get out of this as uh, well as possible. Um, first of all, we have developed uh, this type of uh, remote uh, communications and, and working methods, including votes uh, in plenaries um, in a record time, I would say. But still, uh, many of the colleagues are, for good reasons, uh, very concerned that, for instance, we cannot debate properly in the plenary. And the whole idea of a parliament is to, to debate and then decide. So um, indeed, um, in order for the parliament to, to really be a, a kind of a scrutiny, a scrutinizing um, institution of the EU, it has not been great, but it's, uh, it's worked to some extent. So now the question is that how can we find a way back to a fully functioning Brussels uh, based parliament? And I assume with different countries opening at different times, the lockdown, what we have, we have issues there with some members of parliament being able to come back, some members of parliament not being able to come back. Has there been any conversation on how this will be rolled out over the next few months or longer? 
Uh, well, uh, I think there's been a bit of an obscure idea of how this uh, way back to, to fully pledged parliament will happen. Uh, it's kind of, um, it's clear that uh, many uh, members are already in Brussels, but uh, this is exactly what we are discussing uh, with the president and with the, the 13 other vice presidents of the parliament on Monday. And we, we Greens demand that there's a very clear roadmap to, to, to come back to this in an, well, these days one has to say in an orderly way because we don't want to damage and, and risk anybody's health. So on the one side, we have an EU level part, the parliament trying its best to continue working, but having difficulties there. And then at member state level, we also have a whole other range of issues. Um, turning to, to Gwendolyn, um, COVID-19 in some cases has been used as an excuse to roll back some of the democratic norms that we, we have. Um, and I think people have been particularly shocked by what the situation um, as we've seen it uh, in Hungary. It's not a new problem um, and you've been following it closely uh, with your work in the parliament, but um, has there been any new dimensions now that we've seen with COVID-19 uh, in relation to Hungary? <clears throat> Well, um, as you said, it's not a new situation and has, that has to be stressed. And since the beginning, uh, the parliament has been saying uh, and others, other stakeholders that um, they would be maybe a moment of crisis or one aspect of the world that would help at that moment the government of Hungary to really seize the power in a more authoritarian way that it has ever done. Um, but it has been for now a decade uh, progressively putting, constructing, building up the situation for it to happen. So COVID-19 has been the excuse, but we can say that we were uh, fearing this since a long time. The first resolution in Parliament um, was in 2012, so it's mm. really not new. There mm. were resolutions nearly every year in Parliament about the Hungarian situation from 2012, and it came to the uh, famous Article 7 triggering by the, by the Parliament in 2018. Um, and it has to be said that if the parliament triggered the, the Article 7, it's because no one else was acting. And, and in fact, the parliament would have liked the council and the commission before to act. Um, since 2018 and this famous uh, Article 7 being triggered with the Sargentini report, uh, things were even getting worse all the time. And this autumn in 2019, we, we remember that there was a, a study made uh, by journalists, uh, reporters without borders, European Federation of Journalists and others saying that in Hungary, the situation of censorship was very, very bad, that you had nobody in prison like in Turkey or in Russia, but this, the feeling of censorship was nearly as bad as in these countries. Um, and we had also this awful bill about judiciary that made uh, the independence of judiciary in Hungary very difficult. So everything was built up. And then, of course, the moment of the crisis, the moment uh, was seized by the Hungarian government and the Prime Minister Orban to find a way to get even more power. And it is this emergency um, system that they put in place. It's not the only emergency system, 14, between 14 or 16, it depends how you evaluate it system of emergency have been put in place in, in European Union, it has to be said in all the member states, but this is the only one with no sunset clause. The government of, of Hoban doesn't have to come back in front of the parliament. It can go on like that for ages if it wants to. And of course they used this special situation to start putting up a lot of decrees and new laws that are very bad. They attempted to attack the local level and take out all the money and even the power and the control from the municipalities, for example, where there are a lot of opponents. Uh, Budapest is an opposition mayor, for example, and they also did more polemic um, attempts against a number of people. So they had this new gender recognition law that pre obliges you to decide if you're a woman or a man, but you cannot be both or either. And um, of course, very uh, yesterday, again, they did this thing of uh, deciding not to ratify the Istanbul Convention, so putting in danger women. So they're doing this on an everyday basis. I could tell you much more because every day they do a new thing and they are using this situation to, of course, 
make an, a lot of new decrees. They don't have to battle in Parliament, um, so it's much easier for them. Parliament is acting about this. There's been a lot of uh, outspoken people mm -hmm. talking in Parliament. There's been a sentence in the resolution about COVID-19 situation last month. There is a debate next month, but we are expecting actions from Commission and from Council. And to talk about the future in Hungary uh, after COVID-19 is a big question mark. Um, it's a big question mark about the, the financing of NGOs and journalists. Independent media are today completely suffocating. They have no more money. Um, and the NGOs more, less and less. So will there be people to, to, to act democratically still after the crisis? There's, of course, uh, the general state of the country, because we know that um, the health system is very bad and all of this. So probably a lot of things will be hided during this crisis. And of course, the situation of democracy itself. Uh, because it's it's going to put even more and more power in uh, Hungarian's government. Just for, uh, uh, an info, um, a survey was done a few weeks ago in Hungary, less than 50%, um, uh, at almost 50% of the population in Hungary that was questioned in this survey think they do no more live in a democratic state. Um, finally, what about future in Europe when about rule of law and democracy when you think about this and the, the fact that we are letting this happening. It is, if we do not act on what is happening in Hungary, I think we are in big danger in European Union because we have, we will be letting an autocratic system being put in place and we will, uh, we will then accept the fact that in European Union we can ex coexist with a state that is become autocratic and one American think tank and one uh, NGO, American NGO, Freedom um, Expression, has stated that for them Hungary has become a non-democratic state. Uh, but there are some positive aspects and we can hope that now rule of law will really be part of the dialogue in the European Union when it wasn't for years and years on financial means, but also on the daily dialogue in the European Union, we can think that now it has become clear for everyone that rule of law is one of the core issues of European Union and not only the economical aspects as usually. So keeping in the, in the same region and same team then, um, with, with regard to Poland, Terry, do we see, is Poland on the, going down the same road as Hungary? Are we faced with not one, but two uh, democratic uh, problems in big member states? Or are we looking at a different um, situation there? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, before I start talking about Poland, I wanted to wish all of you a happy Liberation Day. I think especially as a German, uh, this day is always a very important reminder um, that uh, Europe cannot be taken for granted and how well, we, we actually we have a question uh, someone's asking where did you get that lovely t-shirt so if you, you know, know what I just tweeted on my Twitter that we are making a lottery I don't know if this is actually proper English to um, to give away 10 of these t-shirts so if you want to have a t-shirt like this retweet my tweet and then you will be in the lottery um, <laughs> So uh, no, to be serious, for me, this is really an important day. And I think it's also a good reminder that we have to stand up for democracy and, and rule of law. My grandparents didn't do that. Um, and I think in the end, um, the outcome was the most horrible days uh, that we have seen in Europe so far. So um, that basically uh, reminds us of why it is so important. And I can only support what Gwen has been saying. Um, it is not... Uh, a separated development. We see an authoritarian attack on rule of law, uh, on democracy, and also on fundamental rights, very importantly. Um, well, in actually in most member states of the European Union, and in some member states, most notably Hungary and Poland, these people have um, already come very, very close to power or are in power. Um, and I don't want to say everything. I could also give a half hour speech about all the things that have happened in Poland. I just wanted to highlight three points. First of all, um, the attacks on the independent uh, independence of the judiciary in Poland continue. 
Um, and that is why now, after a very long time and a lot of pushing, um, the European Commission is going to start an infringement procedure on Poland um, because basically the peace party, so the ruling party in Poland, has taken political control of the judiciary. Um, and this obviously goes against the very values of the European Union, against Article 2 of, of the treaties. Um, and it also means that there is no proper separation of power anymore. Um, judges are being harassed, judges are being put under pressure, they're being intimidated if they are not acting, if they're not um, giving uh, rulings in a way that the, um, that the governing party wants. Um, so uh, I think in this field, um, finally, after uh, pushing a lot for it, um, the European Commission is taking further actions, which is a good sign, but it's not enough because there are also other fields um, where we see very worrying developments in Poland. And then, as I said, it's not only about the rule of law, but also about fundamental rights. And I wanted to name two legislative proposals here that have been put into the same, so into the Polish <coughs> parliament um, under the restriction of the coronavirus. There is no state of emergency in Poland yet, so the parliament continues to work um, as usual, more or less. Um, but obviously, um, the ability for the civil society, for example, to organize demonstrations, to organize protests, is very heavily curtailed. And under these preconditions, two proposals, one to basically de facto prohibit uh, access to abortion in Poland and one to criminalize uh, providing information on sexuality and sexual and reproductive rights um, to uh, minors um, were discussed in the Polish parliament. Um, unfortunately, they have not been voted down, but the majority uh, of the peace government um, moved them to the next stage into the committee. And, and this is absolutely worrying because um, these two laws um, very heavily attack women's rights, but also LGBTI rights, um, as you can see, uh, and Simon also um, already mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the LGBTI intergroup in the European Parliament, um, and the community um, is under very heavy attack in Poland, um, and this is also something that we believe as Greens, but also the European Parliament should be part of the Article 7 procedure against Poland. So far, the focus is solely on the independence of the judiciary. We would like to broaden the scope. And then the last point I wanted to mention is the presidential elections. Probably a lot of you have heard that this Sunday there was initially supposed to be the presidential election. Then there was a lot of fights about whether this election can take place, under which conditions. I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, the governing party was insisting that it should take place and basically wanted to change the electoral law just a few days, basically yesterday, before the election, which is regarding uh, rule of law, um, uh, not acceptable. That's what very clearly the Venice Commission says, but this is also in the Polish constitution itself that you cannot just change electoral law a couple of days and uh, not even a couple of weeks before an election. After all, um, they couldn't find a majority um, in the parliament for doing this. So now the government has pledged that they're not going to do the election on Sunday. It's not being canceled, but it's not going to be done. Then the Supreme Court is supposed to um, invalidate the election. And then we will see at what point there actually is going to be a presidential election. At the moment, this seems to be absolutely up to a couple of people that are doing backroom deals um, from, from the ruling party. I think this very clearly shows under which difficult situation the state of democracy is in Poland. Um, uh, Gwen was mentioning the Freedom House Index. Also there, Poland has gone down. It is not yet a non-democracy, but it has um, basically been moved to a hybrid regime. Um, and I think that all of these things um, should really um, not only worry us, but make us act. Um, and if I can uh, finish by saying that um, I think for a lot of people in Poland, it has been absolutely important that they had European solidarity because yes, these are measures that are taken in Poland and they mostly affect Polish citizens, but these Polish citizens are also EU citizens. And this is why the European Union has to protect their fundamental rights. Thanks, Terry. I'm, I'm conscious we also want to bring in Daniel to talk um, uh, uh, on, on these things as well, particularly around the conference on the future of Europe. But just a, a more general question for all four of you. Uh, some of these things are ongoing and, and, and a long, uh, uh, an issue long before the corona uh, uh, crisis. But a lot, there's a, a lot of questions over what the EU response can be or should be, uh, particularly when we have one question from JC uh, Laplace asking, 
Um, for Article 7, you need unanimity at council and Poland will vote um, against, so impossible to do anything against Hungary. Um, what do you think can actually be done? Obviously, the report from 2018 is now two years ago and still we don't see, we see nothing but a, a downward trend in Hungary. An open question about what is the EU's response when it comes to these infringe infringements on rule of law? Well, uh, I mean, to, to maybe give a few ideas on, on that question first, I, I think the, the ultimate lever that the union has is, is, is the money, right? Uh, the, the, the share of EU money in uh, public expenditure, particularly in, in Hungary, is, is incredibly high. It's something like 90% of all public sector uh, projects and investment have a share of EU money in them. Uh, and often it's the, sh the share that actually makes the project uh, work at all. So, so the union needs to, to, to use that uh, possibility. And I think there, there's two avenues here, right? One is what we're negotiating now, uh, sort of this rule of law mechanism, whereby if we have generalized deficiencies of, of the rule of law, then the EU should be able to cut uh, EU funding or reroute uh, that, that funding through, through other operators than the national government. Uh, that that is um, that is responsible for for the infringements, um, but I mean I, I I'm quite positive that that already under the existing rules there there is much more that the European Union uh, could be doing. Um, there is in the general provisions on structural funds, for example, there is rules that if the monitoring and control system does not work, then the, then the union can withhold funding. And I think in a situation where basically all of investigations systematically don't lead anywhere, where we have a situation in Hungary where basically close family and friends of Orban uh, are becoming the richest people in the country, uh, mostly through public contracts that they win uh, from his government. I think one can argue that the, the, the control mechanisms that are in place, uh, the, the lack of independence of the judiciary, now the, the parliament that isn't fully operational anymore, I think to make that argument that the control mechanisms are no longer in place, you're, you're, you're no longer pushing that argument. And, and I don't really understand why um, the commission is not, is not using these tools that they have at their disposal to, to exert the ne necessary pressure to, to prevent these kind of developments in Hungary. Well, maybe let's stick with that. I don't know if Heidi or, or, or the other speakers have anything on this. What If we have all the mechanisms in place, why uh, make, aren't we using them? Well, uh, of course, it's a question of political will. And it's not a secret that, for instance, uh, concerning Hungary, and uh, we all know it very well, and Gwen is uh, certainly working on this every day and week, that um, uh, the ruling party of Hungary is still a part of the dominant uh, biggest uh, group in the European Parliament. So um, there's a lack of political will to deal with this. And it's ever more serious because now we see from that Freedom House uh, Index uh, that in fact uh, there's a growing disregard everywhere towards uh, conditions that are the basis of our democracy. So uh, this is dead serious. And uh, I've been a bit concerned and um, I mean not only me but also the Greens in general that in this COVID-19 uh, confinement period uh, the parliament has um, been a bit, um, let's say, uh, reluctant to define human rights as a, as a core business, because we, of course, had to sort of uh, secure our um, involvement in legislation, in the budget procedure. But equally, we Greens believe that we have to stay very active on human rights. Um, and um, at the moment, we don't have yet um, sort of monthly um, debates on, on uh, ongoing human rights violations in, in the world. Uh, and I hope we will come back to that very soon, because um, this only leaves the possibility for us to, to draft letters to the Commission, to uh, the Council and to, to whoever, to, who, to rulers uh, around the world. So what I can notice, and I think this uh, we know everyone very well, that uh, we are sending letters and letters, uh, for instance, um, I, I think Terry was coordinating a letter on um, protesting against hate speech against LGBTI people in Turkey. We sent that yesterday. Daniel has been working very hard with his uh, uh, anti-corruption um, uh, intergroup, which is an informal group on, on making sure that the COVID-19 uh, subsidies and, and support mechanisms are not 
involving any kind of uh, corruption. So we have a lot of opportunities, but properly this parliament is not uh, still uh, acting, I think. Just to Gwendolyn and then Terry, and then we'll move on to our future uh, uh, plans. But is it sticking to the on this point? We have all the tools, but not the political will to act. Is that a, a good summary of, of where we are at EU level? Yeah, that's what I always say. Um, <clears throat> as as Daniel said, and I, I also alluded to it at the end of my first uh, moment of talking, um, on the long term, um, we are, I think, this parliament and the two other institutions are starting to build up a system where a rule of law will be unavailable, unavoidable. Um, the three institutions are working on their own rule of law report in one way or another. Uh, the council with the German presidency starting in June should really start on this peer review report they have in mind. Didier Reinders, as a commissioner, has really uh, made the commitment of having an every year report on each member states about rule of law with three topics, anti-corruption, freedom um, of um, media and independence of justice. And the parliament itself is working on its rule of law mechanism. And also we have this idea about the MFF and indeed having a really, really strong conditionality about rule of law in MFF. This. You may um, need to uh, explain what yes, MFF so in, is. In, in, uh, MFF is finance, so it's the multi-financial <laughs> framework, but yes, on, on the finances, but this is about 2021 and maybe not even as soon because we are being late in budget discussions, so it could be later. So we also need to structure things now. This is a bit why the, the money response is a good one on the long term, but it's not one now. Uh, and until if, if things were only to start in 2022 uh, about this money condition, and it seems that rule of law will be a condition, then they're working really seriously on this in council. Even if it starts, it will be maybe too late for Poland and Hungary. So things have to be done now. Uh, just to say on the financial point of view, they could be uh, quick funds given in these member states to NGOs that have had all their funds cut or to independent journalism. Um, and we are talking about recovery plans. We are giving a lot of money to enterprises, um, to business, and it should be also the case. Uh, but on the short term, we could also hope for infringement um, uh, action taken taken by the Commission uh, towards these two member states, they often manage, the Commission often manages to do infringements action against Poland, and it's not the case with Hungary. There's been nearly no infringement action um, uh, towards Hungary, and lately Vera Jourova, the Commissioner, has even said publicly she doesn't see the ground for an infringement. I mean, there's no sunset clause in the emergency rule, and it seems that our European law, a European system doesn't have the ground, juridical ground to say anything about that. So that seems very strange. And there we would really want the Commission to be a bit more innovative and a bit more creative, stay in the in the structure of law, of course, but we do think that there they are being too timid. Um, and then I wanted to really, really, really stress the point of the Council and the isolation of Hungary. Of course, for a lot of things, you need unanimity. But today, it's not even the problem to have 26, uh, 25 country, member states out of 27 taking out Hungary in Poland. Is that we don't even have 20 member states speaking loudly. We do not even have that. At the best moments, we had 13 to 14 member states saying this is not acceptable. Um, and we always see them as usual same one. Uh, the Nordic member states are of course examples on this. France, Germany, Netherlands do a lot of work. We have Portugal that most of this uh, is always joining but a bit silent. But some member states are completely um, uh, uh, absent of the debate and they never say look, this is not good. So we do have a problem. If Hungary and Poland felt that they had no allies in the rest of Union Europe, European Union, it would help if these governments felt that they were lonely, which is not the case. Um, ID uh, talked about EPP, and it is a problem. It is a problem that Fidesz is in the biggest group of the parliament. That's for sure. But I would say that for me, it's not the biggest problem because the EPP 
members of parliament, a part of them have been courageous on this since the beginning, and they've been voting all the resolutions. And it's sometimes more difficult to, to point, pinpoint someone from your own camp. So they've been more courageous than governments. A lot of governments are not saying anything, and in commission the same. We know that there are fights in the commission, and that we do not have a commission that is strong on this. So the question of isolating Hungary and Poland on this is for me a key issue, and there we are just lacking courage and political will. Terry, I see you nodding along and maybe taking some notes there. Do you want to come in on this point about the commission and the council not acting? Um, no, I can I can only agree with what has been said, and I just wanted to say one more time: it's an absolute di disgrace that this party is still a member of the EPP. I really think the the, the European People's Party, so the Conservative Party, and I can only tell all the viewers if you can put pressure on your conservative party in your member state in one or the other way especially in germany because i think the german conservatives are going to play an important role if they would change their opinion fidesz would be out of epp um, very very soon um, then really do that because um having them under this you know like uh we we call it the code of democracy still um it's 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 simply unbearable and it just makes the situation also politically much more difficult um, to push for um, that's why it's so important that we put pressure on epp that they finally kick them out okay so now looking toward a uh, more future orientated conversation the recovery will of course mean a lot of reform at eu level and um, we've called for that in our recovery and resilience um, paper and in particular, we focus on the need for the Conference on the Future of the European Union uh, to uh, profoundly reform the European Union, quote, uh, making it more effective, united, democratic, sovereign and resilient, um, with citizens being fully involved in the recovery measures. Um, Daniel, we have a very basic question first, is what, what is the Conference on the Future of Europe and what is the, the main aim? Well, we don't fully know yet what it's going to be. The, the European Parliament has an idea of what, what it wants the conference to be, uh, but um, it's it's not alone for the European Parliament to decide. It's uh, uh, It should be something where the national governments, where the Commission, where national parliaments as well, uh, come together to, to discuss well, where do we want to go with the with the European Union? And and what we in the Parliament have said uh, very loudly as well is we we want to involve citizens in this process. If you look at, you know, I mean, today we're celebrating 75 years of the end of the Second World War, but tomorrow we're celebrating 70 years of the Schuman Declaration, right? So the very courageous French foreign minister at the time that uh, set us on the part the path of European integration, and I think sort of the core ideas that he, ha that he had, that this isn't done in, in, in one step or according to one plan, but it's a, it's a gradual pro process of integration and that the, the main uh, principle at the heart of that is solidarity. I think those two principles of the Schuman Declaration that we're celebrating today remain as, as strong and as current today as they have been 70 years ago. So, we, we have had major reform of the EU that originated about 20 years ago during the last convention, right? Um, we have seen a number of crises since then. We've gone through the euro and the financial crisis. We've had uh, the whole uh, thing around migration and, and asylum in Europe. Uh, now we're going into, into another financial crisis uh, resulting from, the, from, the, from COVID-19. And I think what we're seeing is that time and again, uh, there, there is sort of underlying fundamental issues uh, in Europe that the sort of continental challenges that we're facing, Europe is often not equipped uh, either because of the institutional framework or because of the, the money that we have or the competences that, that the EU has, we're not fully equipped to, to face these challenges and, and deliver really satisfying uh, answers and results for, for citizens. And I think, that's precisely the idea to discuss that with citizens directly, because the biggest lesson learned for me from the last process that we that that we did and where sort of the constitution for Europe uh, failed in referenda in France in the Netherlands and then even the, the, the resulting Lisbon Treaty first failed in, in Ireland was a bit that 
the, the, the grand plan that the convention came up with was only this discussed with citizens more broadly when when it was done right and so the idea being that let's let's embark on on a new attempt to substantially reform the european union but let's bring european citizens into that conversation uh, from the from the outset and we have looked quite a bit at the at the good examples of uh, randomly selected citizens assemblies that have taken place in the last few years for example in ireland uh, we have a good example now of a climate convention taking place in france uh, many many examples across europe poland germany and elsewhere uh, at local and regional level uh, that we want to learn from and, and replicate uh, in a way at the european level if it was to, uh, and it's a big if from my understanding, uh, open up treaty change, is there, we're all, we always say, oh, treaty change is too difficult, too difficult. And now we have this added issue of, of countries like Hungary and Poland being classed as no longer uh, uh, democratic countries. Is this posed fraught with risks, uh, this conference on the future of Europe in, that, in the context of where we are now, or do we see it as Greens as an opportunity? And maybe Daniel first, and then we can open it to our other our other guests. I, I I would definitely say opportunity, and I would say that, I mean, for me, the way that I see things, if if we think that the that the current status quo and and staying within the current framework and not changing anything about the union is risk free, well, then we're mistaken, right? I think. Uh, that a union that is sort of stuck a bit halfway on the path of integration. For example, if you look at the euro, right, we have the common currency, but we don't really have common uh, social policy, we don't have common taxation, we don't have common, uh, you know, economic policy. Um, that that means that uh, we 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 don't get all the advantages of of a common economy, uh, but we get all the disadvantages of of a common economy. And and I don't think that this halfway integration is really stable. So in a, in a way, for me, the risk of the status quo is is greater than embarking on this conversation about what needs to change and where do we all as Europeans want want to go from here. If if that. You know, I, I don't think it would be, but if the result of that conversation is, well, we, we actually don't want Europe, we want to go back to uh, small city state uh, solutions, uh, then, you know, if, if that's the democratic decision, then we, we also would need to accept that. But I think if we have that conversation and if we make the strong argument that we're all stronger and better off together, uh, then I think that is an argument that we can win and that we should win uh, to, to bring Europe into into the next step of integration. Maybe Heidi, do you want to come in on, on this? Um, as a, a vice president, I'm sure you've seen some internal discussions on, on, on the scope and depth of this uh, uh, conference. Yes, um, but I think uh, the, the battle will really be about um, uh, whether a treaty changes uh, are bound to happen or not. But I think uh, it's very important that we argue, as Daniel has done, that there are several areas which are now uh, really not uh, uh, satisfactory. We have said um, yes to the euro, but we haven't uh, taken consequences of that. And I think uh, uh, it's ever more dangerous that now um, uh, citizens in Southern Europe, in Italy and, and Spain, they, they have completely lost trust uh, in, in what the EU could do because some of uh, the more northern states, including Finland, unfortunately, have um, sort of questioned this, uh, what we Greens would like to see as, as basic solidarity. And um, so I see that the euro area needs to be fixed. Uh, that's one thing. We need more, more shared responsibility. Uh, mutual um, sharing of responsibility. And then, of course, there is this, um, let's say, the 2015 uh, events um, around uh, migration. Uh, there's been very, very little progress, if any, on that. And I think um, that we need to see how we can ease decision making. And that's another challenge. A third one I want to mention that uh, the EU is really quite disabled in, um, in, in global arena on, on let's say, um, the United States even, even under Trump, can criticize human rights violations on certain countries, whereas uh, uh, when the EU goes to, to UN meetings, uh, its hands are tied because some member states uh, don't want to criticize the, any, any authoritarian government. So I think we have to fix this because um, 
the EU is there to be bigger than, uh, than its parts, uh, its components, the member states. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's tragic to see that the EU cannot really uh, fulfill this role of, uh, of being a fully fledged political actor in the international area. Gwendolyn and Terry, we'll just sum up on this round of, of, of reform or our future plans for Europe. What do you think now this crisis has kind of revealed needs to change? I'm not sure this crisis has revealed much to us, at least, um, Greens, because um, it, it's just proven a lot that we already feared or, or imagined, uh, and, and the same for a lot of citizens or NGOs um, we work with. Um, as, as Daniel said, I mean, of course, we must hope that this Conference of Europe will bring change. Um, and and to, be, to, to recall, this Conference of Europe was decided because of last election, because already the results of nationalist parties and all of this made a lot of our friends in the, con in the more um, usual parties, the conservatives and the socialists think, and they thought, look, there's a problem with Europe. We are feeling a rejection of Europe. We must do something, we must change. Um, and uh, so we can hope Conference of Europe will, as, as Daniel said, I think common taxation is a good example. Uh, we, would, we could hope a legislative initiative for Europe and Parliament, we, we could all anyway more uh, powers for for the parliament because they are the representative of the citizens uh, and not the representatives of the government which makes a big difference and we can hope less unanimity in council but once again um, as Daniel also stated, there's a lot that can be done already. And what I hope that this crisis could show is that um, the, the, we bear the responsibility, the free institutions to act and not to be only in, in declaration. And, and I'm, I'm not that optimist, I must say. Um, we are, we are co going slowly to the end of the first wave of confinement. They'll maybe another one but at least we're coming out of the first one we will be starting the german presidency of the council and honestly nothing happened during six months with the croatian uh, presidency something is is not normal there it's not normal that during these six months um and and mostly during the confinement situation uh, europe seems to seem to be a bit paralyzed the parliament once again I think was quite active and saying things and, and doing resolution and not just advocating, but really giving proposal and scrutinizing situations. But the council and the commission looked very much paralyzed and it should not be normal that we can spend few months like that having um, institutions that are uh, paralyzed. And there again, this is just political will. We need people uh, in governments and in commission to think how important their job is on the European level and that this is a space they have to get involved in. The first reaction of all the member states was to shut the borders. That tells a lot. The first reaction was that they thought the place they had to involve to get involved in is their own space. Um, sometimes I feel that citizens, in fact, are more confident in Europe than the states themselves are. Terry. Uh, well, I think on the concrete things uh, now, Gwen, Heidi and, um, and Daniel have already said a lot of smart stuff um, where I think we would need to see change, maybe a little bit of a broader point, um, which I think has especially been shown, I mean, for me through Brexit and the debate um, that uh, well, precedented the vote then, then the referendum, then also the debate afterwards. Um, is that we cannot take this project for granted. And I think that this is really something that every generation has to fight for this again. And um, that is also something that I hope can come from the Future of Europe conference, because obviously we want input, but we also want people to realize. And I think in the UK, a lot of people realize that too late, that you cannot just sit and, and you know, believe that the status quo is going to stay like this. Um, and I think we are, and I, I don't want to be uh, too pessimistic, but I think we are in a really, really um, 
deep institutional and democratic crisis in the European Union. And um, that is not um, because of the attacks uh, on, on rule of law um, and, and democracy only. That is also because of the lack of response and the, the lack of the question, what is actually the direction that we want to go into? And I think that making people aware of the fact that they will have to give this direction, that this is a, a right and a chance that they have, but that it's also a responsibility um, if they want to stay uh, in this united in diversity European Union. I think this for me would be important to, to address citizens with. And this is also what I'm saying, like when I go back home to Gelsenkirchen, I'm not telling them like, it's all great. I think we have to be honest with the situation and we have to say, um, and as European citizens, either you take up this responsibility now or it looks pretty grim for the future. Okay, thank you. I don't want to add on such a, a grim note. I hope we will have <laughs> some hope for the future in our EU democracy. Yeah, but, but, I, but Simon, please, I think, uh, I think Terry has really uh, made a very important point. And I, I would say that we Greens have um, always had this merit that uh, we see that uh, we, uh, the citizens, uh, the world needs the EU. And we have always said that it has deficiencies, but let's work on them because we can make the best out of it. And there's so many good things happening, even at this very moment in the shadow of this crisis. I'm working a lot on corporate uh, accountability, business and human rights, and there are really movements there because uh, people need, uh, need to, to realize that they do need us, needs that, that the EU is the actor that is going to take these things forward in the world. And it's a global situation that we are in. So. Anyway, there's a lot of positive challenges in, in saying that it's not perfect. It's far from perfect. Yeah, I, I, I would maybe, I mean, I, I share all the analysis of, 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 of Terry and, and, and the others. And I think there is a lot of things to, to improve, to fix, uh, to make better. But I think we, we, we cannot describe the challenge as so, so big that we cannot overcome it, right? Because then, then we're just all giving up and, and that's it. We, we lost the fight. And, and I really don't think that we're at that point. For me, there there is hope. Uh, I, I am optimistic that we that we can achieve reform. I don't think that the, I mean no no one should see the conference on the future of Europe as this two year exercise whereby uh, all the problems Europe has ever had are are are, are now solved, right? And we. Can out and everything's peachy, and we can close the European Parliament because it's all done now, right? Um, but but I I am optimistic in the sense that uh, we we all can change Europe if 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 we want to. I think the European election last year uh, was uh, was really quite positive. Uh, huge participation, huge uh, outcome for for pro-European uh, sensible politicians. I would say uh, beyond the green wave that that we ourselves created. Um, so so I'm I'm really quite hopeful that this can be something good and in any case uh, we need to fight uh, very hard to to make that happen because that's the only way that it that it can actually happen the moment that we say it, it cannot be fixed we give up uh, that that's exactly when when the union will will turn out for the worst so i'm i'm, I'm definitely up for the for, for the fight thanks daniel we're going to conclude now if anyone has any final words on anything in particular they want to share i'll take uh, gwendo you're on mute there we go yeah maybe what we can say uh and and terry will ex is experimenting the same is that in hungary and poland um the the citizens and and they're not just a few, a lot of people are sending us message, um, wanting to, to ask us questions, wanting to work with us. So there is a big um, desire for Europe in these two member states. There's a big desire to stay in Europe because they know this is their hope for more democracy, more rule of law. Um, and th there is a desire for our scrutiny. They, they really want us as parliamentary to, to monitor and to know more about what's happening in their, in their member states and to say it to the big wide public of European Union. So um, once again, I, what I said just before, I think citizens are very um, um, eager to have more Europe and better Europe. Uh, once again, often we have a problem with the leaders in governments. 
Thanks, Gwen. I think the fight continues. Uh, can Terry, I, just, can yeah. I just make one wish to everybody watching? I mean, tomorrow is uh, the day of Europe. So um, I think if we want to start this movement for changing Europe to the better, um, I think making some noise for Europe tomorrow would already be uh, an important sign. So on your social media and everywhere else, um, make some noise for Europe tomorrow. And we, of course, have to wish Terry a happy birthday as well on this day. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, it was very insightful. Um, the Greens group, Green IFA group, will continue with webinars over the coming weeks. We'll be back on the 18th of uh, May to talk about farming, agriculture and reform of the common agricultural policy. Uh, you can check out our recovery and resilience um, paper our policy on this um, on our website or on Facebook. Uh, thank you for all your questions that have come in. We will get back to you on um, our Facebook page with answers to all of them after this. And the video will be available uh, to rewatch over and over again, if that's what you want to do with your time <laughs> it's, uh, from tomorrow afternoon. So thank you all for joining and we'll see you next time. And thanks Simon for leading us through this. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.